Warning, the episode you are about to hear contains discussion of an extremely violent and graphic crime. This episode will include graphic depictions of heinous acts. Listener discretion is strongly advised. The world of ritualistic child abuse. The they would sacrifice animals. Does it make you want to hate murder, or does it make you want to do murder? Let's explore the darkness of mankind, one crime at a time. Welcome back to Rogue Darkness, the podcast that uncovers how the misinterpretations and misinformation surrounding witchcraft, the occult, and other beliefs have led many to do unthinkable crimes. From ritualistic killings and the demons that live in all of us, to exploration of the macabre and delving deep into the unknown, let's explore the darkness of mankind, one crime at a time. I'm your host of the grim and gruesome, Raven. Let's go rogue and get right into today's chilling crime. The case of Sean Sellers and how he brutally murdered his parents, all the while claiming that demons had possessed his body and commanded he perform a sacrifice to Satan in order for him to take full control over his life. But let's start off from the very beginning. On November 22, 1968, a young Vonda Blackwell, only 15 at the time, and Richard Sellers, 17 years old at the time, wed in Kings County, California. A few short months after their wedding, the couple gave birth to their son, Sean Richard Sellers, on May 18, 1969, in Corcoran, California. Their marriage quickly deteriorated, though, being quite young at the time Sean was born, and with Richard being an alcoholic and heavily relying on alcohol to drown out his problems. Upon divorcing Richard in 1972, Vonda took baby Sean back to her home state of Oklahoma so she could be with her family as he grew older. By the mid-1970s, Vonda had been regularly seeing a man named Paul Lee Bellafato, and they decided to tie the knot and get married, with Paul now becoming Sean's stepfather. It was reported, though, that shortly after their marriage, the state of Oklahoma had been hit hard with economic recession, making finances tight and situations needing to rapidly be changed in order to maintain a livelihood. Paul reportedly worked as a truck driver at the time, and due to the economic hardship, Vonda made the decision to work alongside her husband as his team driver, many times being on the road together for three to four weeks at a time, and sometimes even longer. This career decision came with drastic changes for young Sean, forcing him to have to stay with his grandfather and step-grandmother while his parents were working. His step-grandmother, Geneva, reportedly stated that while he stayed with them, she noticed that Sean was unique and that he always held such high standards for himself in all that he did, both academically and in his personal endeavors, even while he was just a child. While Sean was in third grade, his mom and stepdad decided to move down to California from their home in Oklahoma, and it was around this time that Sean reportedly started to hear voices in his head, ones that would reportedly constantly criticize him. Being such a young boy at the time, Sean didn't think much of it and assumed that it was something normal that all people dealt with. If he had only known that it was an underlying mental illness, someone could have possibly intervened and gotten him help for it early on. At the age of eight, Sean's babysitter that would help out in between his grandparents' and parents' care would reportedly oftentimes bring occultist books over and show them to Sean. He was immediately mesmerized and, being so young and impressionable, was eager to keep learning more about the occult, specifically Satanism. Although he was only eight at the time, Sean knew that his interest in the occult would be frowned upon by his family, so he kept it a secret. Throughout the year of 1977, when Sean was just in fourth grade, he had moved back and forth between Oklahoma and California a few times due to his parents taking on a new trucking company, causing him to have to stay with his grandparents, who he ultimately grew even closer with as the years passed. In 1979, Sean's grandfather and step-grandmother ended up divorcing, but it was reported that Sean didn't seem too affected by it. And given how close he was to them over the years, and them being his primary caretakers more often than not, I find it extremely hard to believe he wasn't affected. In the 1980s, things began to go immensely downhill for Sean. From frequent beatings from his grandparents and ridicule from his other family members, to being forced to harm animals against his will, Sean was on a dark road that no child should ever have to walk. 
It was reported that as a young child, likely due to the instability in his home life, Sean would sometimes wet the bed. When this would happen, Sean's uncle would force him to wear the diapers on his head if he ended up having accidents two nights in a row. It was a form of immense humiliation that in his uncle's mind would force Sean to not wet the bed further. Along with the humiliation from his uncle, Sean would also receive beatings from his grandparents when he wet the bed. So we can see how these punishments and acts of abuse against Sean affected him drastically. At the age of 12, Sean learned about the game Dungeons and Dragons, and he soon became extremely fond of it, to the point of almost an obsession. When his mother found out that he was so into the game, she immediately signed him up for church camp in an attempt to try and prevent him from turning to evil as the game was viewed as having a negative influence on those who played it. While at church camp, Sean met a girl there who he quickly became enamored with. He even went to the extent of wanting to marry her. At that time, Sean attempted to make a pact with God, stating that if the girl would love him back, he'd do anything God wanted him to and rededicate his life to God. That little crush didn't evolve into much though, because once summer camp ended and Sean returned back home, his parents decided to up and move once again, this time heading to Greeley, Colorado. Now living in Colorado at the age of 14, Sean's parents believed he was old enough to be on his own while they were on the road working, so Sean was many times left alone for extended periods of time. This led to him becoming increasingly lonely and depressed, ultimately turning back to his interest in Satanism and becoming attached to its teachings for comfort. It was at this time Sean partook in his first satanic ritual, where he then began pondering whether evil was actually better than good. Time passed with the repetition of Sean's parents coming home for short periods of time, then leaving for longer periods of time for work, leaving him alone to basically fend for himself. In 1984, Sean was now 15 years old, and his parents determined it may be best to not leave him on his own for as long as they had been, so they sent him to stay with his aunt in Oklahoma while they would be on the road. Sean ended up hating Oklahoma, missing the friends he had made back in Colorado, so he ended up turning to alcohol and immersed himself into demonology, not caring how others perceived him. In the summer of 1984, Sean went back to Colorado and met with his friends there and had reportedly conducted his first satanic baptism. He also had reportedly attempted to steal some black cloth from a department store to use in his satanic rituals, but the cops figured it was just kids being kids and sent him home with just a warning. It was then that Sean knew he wanted to dedicate his life to Satan, as it brought him the most happiness he had felt in years. When the summer ended, Sean returned to Oklahoma for the school year, and then would come back home the next year to stay with his parents at the age of 16. Just from what we've discussed so far, you can see how much of a roller coaster Sean's childhood really was, going back and forth between his home in Colorado to his aunt and uncle's home in Oklahoma there was never a stable household for him to truly feel at home in. We can see how and why he ultimately turned to Satanism for guidance and comfort, as he unfortunately wasn't getting that from his home life. Young minds are extremely impressionable, and Sean took the influences from his friends, and how he felt a part of something, and then he dedicated himself to that, in hopes of maintaining that feeling of acceptance. Now back in Colorado, reunited with his mom and stepdad, Sean also reunited with one of his childhood friends, Richard Howard, who had always shared the same attachment to Dungeons and Dragons, and who had also reportedly dealt with a similar upbringing as Sean, with an unstable household. Sean and Richard both enjoyed delving into Satanism, and Richard introduced Sean to new friends who soon became a group of friends, all of whom were very willing to learn about Satanism as well. Now with his friends supporting him in his dedication to Satan, Sean's commitment to school, extracurricular activities, and his appearance all fell to the wayside. His mother Vonda, reportedly being a dedicated Christian, forced Sean to go to Bible study, but despite her efforts, his allegiance to Satanism never waved. His spiral into disregard for others only grew from there on out, where on one occasion, Sean went to the extent of eating the leg off of a frog meant for dissection in his school's biology class. Sean was also said to have kept small vials filled with his own blood, which he would then drink during class for all of his peers to witness. It was a means of showing everyone around him that he didn't care what they thought of him. Sean and Richard, along with a small group of their other friends, ended up taking over a small abandoned farmhouse which they would use for satanic rituals. 
In an attempt to show the world how dedicated they were to Satan, Sean and Richard planned their ultimate act of commitment, planning to commit a human sacrifice, a murder. The boys planned to go to a local gas station where a man by the name of Robert Bauer had refused to sell them beer the week prior. Richard stole his grandpa's handgun to use, and then on September 8, 1985, the duo headed to the Circle K that Robert Bauer worked at. Walking into the gas station, Sean immediately pulled out the gun, aimed it at an unsuspecting Robert, and pulled the trigger. The first shot missed, so he shot again, this time hitting Robert, but not fatally. When Robert tried to escape, the two chased him to the back of the gas station where they shot him one last time, killing him. The next day, Sean was reportedly so hyped up from the murder that he immersed himself even deeper into Satanism, believing the murder was an actual sacrifice and that he was only going to make things better by appeasing Satan. Still in school, despite his lack of interest in it, in one of his English classes, Sean at one point had written, Satanism made me a better person, I am free, I can kill without remorse, which alarmed his teacher, causing the teacher to contact Sean's mom. Upon hearing about his dedication to Satanism and insinuation of committing a murder, Sean's mom then sat down and wrote Sean a lengthy, heartfelt letter, telling him how much she loved him, in an attempt to try to show him that she was there for him, despite his rocky upbringing. Now, let's fast forward to the crime that put a halt to Sean's negative actions, the murder of his mom and stepfather. After getting high and passing out for approximately three days, Sean woke up on March 4, 1986, went and found his stepfather's .44 revolver, and then walked into his parents' bedroom, where they were sleeping. Sean aimed the gun first at his stepfather, then shot him in the back of the head, killing him. He then shot his mother twice in the head, killing her as well. After the brutal murder, Sean then attempted to stage the home to look like a robbery had gone wrong. Then he got into his truck and drove to Richard's house to tell him what had just happened. Richard then hid the gun in an air vent, and then the two of them fell asleep for the night. The next day, on March 5th, Sean went back to his house, and to make him seem like a victim rather than the actual murderer, he ran out of the house in earshot of his neighbors, and began crying and yelling that there was so much blood, and that someone had killed his parents. Although he tried to fool everyone, and felt his plan was foolproof, after investigating the crime scene and finding evidence that indicated that he had in fact killed his parents, Sean was then arrested and taken in for questioning. His trial lasted through September of 1986, and it's been reported that throughout the entirety of his trial, Sean remained completely silent, entering a plea of not guilty, while also manipulating his lawyers and believing that he could not remember anything that happened, trying to claim he must have blacked out. At the age of just 17, Sean Sellers was convicted of three counts of first-degree murder for the murders of Robert Bauer, Paul Belafato, and Vonda Sellers. From the years of 1986 through 1999, Sean spent those 13 years in prison. He would spend most of his time writing journal entries about his time in prison, and he was also well-liked among many of the people there. It's been said that any time the Christian missionaries came by the prison, Sean would always put on a front, acting so appreciative and thankful for their time and efforts. Sean even went to the extent of claiming that he had converted to Christianity while in prison, but many people who knew Sean closely, even some of the guards at the prison, viewed him as a conniving, manipulative liar. Other events that occurred during his prison stay was that he made several appearances on the media and on talk shows, some of which included The Oprah Winfrey Show and Geraldo. It's been reported that Sean even got married while in prison back in 1995, but that didn't last very long, and the marriage was soon annulled in 1997. In 1999, Sean's claim of insanity during his trial prior was denied by the Tenth Circuit Court of Appeal. Sean reportedly claimed that he was suffering from multiple personality disorder, and that the court take that into consideration. However, after being evaluated and determining he was not being truthful, the court declined his appeal. Sean even went to the extent to try and appeal all the way up to his execution date, and it's been reported that two days before his set execution date, he had written two additional appeals. Despite Sean's appeal efforts, though, on February 4th, 1999, he was executed by lethal injection, reportedly singing a hymn and saying, Here I come, Father, I'm coming home, amidst his last breath.
So that was the horrific case of Sean Sellers and his regarded sacrifices to Satan. Let me know your thoughts on this case, and if you have any questions regarding it or any other cases I've covered, feel free to contact me at roguedarknesspod at gmail.com. You can also reach me directly on Instagram or Twitter at rogue underscore darkness. I'm always interested in hearing your thoughts on cases I've covered, as well as hear any suggestions you may have for future ones. All the links to the articles referenced in this episode are down below for your reference. And as always, if you like what you hear on Rogue Darkness, please help spread the word by sharing it with your family and friends, and also by leaving a rating and review on Apple iTunes or any other platform where you can leave a review. By rating, reviewing, subscribing, and sharing, you are directly helping the show and getting the word out. And if you're a fan of YouTube like myself and enjoy watching true crime in video format, I recommend you check out my YouTube channel. The link is down below, so definitely check it out and don't forget to subscribe. And if you're looking for even more ways to help support the pod, I do have a Ko-fi page set up, but just a little heads up that I am thinking of possibly switching over to Patreon, so definitely stay tuned for more information regarding that. I'll announce it on here and my socials if and when I do make that switch. And you can also actually get yourself some awesome Rogue Darkness merch through my Bonfire merch store. The link to my Bonfire shop is down below, so definitely check it out. And I've actually forgotten to mention this on the podcast, but I'm hosting a little Yuletide giveaway for my Merry Krampusnacht limited edition sweatshirt. And all you have to do to be entered into the giveaway is to leave a review on Apple iTunes or any other platform that accepts reviews. I originally was just hosting it on Instagram, but have decided I wanted to make it even easier on you all since I know not all of you have Instagram. So if you haven't already, please send in your reviews and let me know you submitted them. And I'll be announcing the winner of the sweatshirt on both my Instagram and Twitter on December 15th. So if you have one of those platforms, definitely follow me on there. It's at rogue underscore darkness. And with that said, that concludes this week's episode of Rogue Darkness. The darkness is all around us. And I can confidently say that reality truly is more terrifying than fiction. Until next time.